I hear the bells tolling, but folks are still coming into the room. So I'm gonna give it a minute or so before we get started. Oops. Gina, is my um, screen sharing now? Yes, I can see yours now. Okay, I think um, maybe maybe we can get started. It's one minute after. So I wanna welcome you all. Um, to the OER Faculty Adoption Celebration. I'm Linda Houck, I'll be moderating this afternoon. I'm the business librarian at um, Falvey, and I'm also a contributor to the Affordable Materials Project. Um, today, uh, we'll have some opening remarks from Randy Weinstein, Associate Vice Pro Provost of Teaching and Learning. And then I'll provide a little background and context about the Affordable Materials Project and open educational resources in general. The main event um, are faculty presentations and um, to be followed by a, a student panel um, with some time for questions and answers. Um, the uh, session is being recorded and probably you've all um, signed off on that. And um, I'd ask that you could, you could maybe use the chat um, to post questions that may come up as we're going. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Randy. Yes, thank you all, and, and thank you to our faculty um, who have chosen to go this route and really help our students. Um, we know there's a large chunk of students at Villanova that struggle financially. Um, we have some students that can afford things, but the majority of our students, you know, are not sitting there with extra money sitting around to just do whatever they want. Um, we did run a survey in the fall of 2020 um, during COVID, where we asked a number of questions of our students, but we found out that about a quarter of our students say that they choose not to buy course materials because of their cost and decide to either try to share with friends, um, try to find stuff online that's suitable, or, or delay their purchase till later in the semester when they absolutely need it, like right before an exam and then return it a week later when they're still allowed to return it. And, and we know that greatly impacts their learning capabilities. And sometimes faculty are attuned to this and sometimes they're kind of oblivious. They just list books on their syllabus and they just assume that everybody has it. So this AMP project here is really designed to try to find a variety of ways to try to save our students money so that they can learn the best way possible and not have to worry about purchasing their course materials. And this open educational resource adoption is one of the best ways to do this, to find free, excellent materials to assign to our students that they can use. And everybody has exactly the same thing and access for the entire course, as opposed to assigning something where the students may or may not choose to purchase that material. So I'm really excited to kind of hear how uh, Jean and Valentina did this semester or last semester with their uh, adoptions and how those really affected the students and their behaviors in their classrooms. And this will add to a continuing number of faculty that we're able to support a little bit, not as much as we like to, but give them a little bit of support to spend their time to find open educational resource materials and work them into their classroom. So thank you all for attending and hope you all hear some great things today. Thanks, Randy. So um, just a little background, the Affordable Materials Project, some call, sometimes called AMP, is a collaboration between the library, the bookstore, the provost's office, 
um, CASA, which is the Center for Access, Success, and Achievement, and VITAL, um, the Villanova Institute of Teaching and Learning. Um, AMP's mission is to educate students and faculty, faculty about ways to select and use low-cost course materials um, and high-quality course materials. And um, we hope that this um, initiative uh, contributes to Vill making Villanova a more inclusive and supportive of the community. Um, the AMP projects include um, community surveying, um, outreach workshops for faculties and faculty students and, and even um, um, parents. Um, we also have a library subscribed uh, a book matching program. And now we have the Open Educational Resource um, Faculty Adoption Award, which we're celebrating today. Um, you may not be alone um, in this group if you're not really sure exactly what OER are. So um, just to sort of give you some more background on that, OER are course materials, often textbooks that are digital first, free and grant permissions to keep, use, share, mix and edit. Um, they're distinguishable from traditional commercial textbooks in several ways. They um, remove or lower cost barriers for students they're accessible on, and available in multiple formats, both digital and print. Um, and they're not rented for uh, a limited period of time. They're av available to students on the first day of class, the last day of class, and after the class ends. Um, because they typically grant permissions with Creative Commons licenses, they may be customized or improved to meet specific learning objectives. Um, students can also participate in OER content creation. Um, this is sometimes called open pedagogy, or renewable assignments. There's a growing body of research showing that OER improves student success and retention. Um, with that said, uh, one of the major motivators behind the popularity of OER um, is a, a cost issue. Um, so textbook prices have increased um, really at a much higher rate than the general, uh, uh, you know, overall in inflation. Um, you can see from this graph that that's the case and that um, increases have sort of um, flattened out over the last four or five years. Um, folks that kind of watch the textbook market closely attribute, it, attribute this sort of uh, flattening out to the adoption of OER very widely um, in many different um, educational settings and also to the adoption of um, commercial digital textbooks. In 2018, SPARC, which is an organization uh, um, that promotes scholarly publishing and academic resources, estimated that, um, that over a billion dollars have been saved by students in the US through the use of OER. The same year, uh, the federal government initiated an open textbook pilot and to date has invested over $24 million um, to, um, in grants to support the development of, of OER. Many um, state governments um, are also supporting OER. And later on in the program, we'll hear, hear a little bit about um, very local um, sources of funding for OER. And this is some data pulled from the same survey that, that I think um, Randy was talking about, um, taken in 2020. This um, Villanova student, student survey um, showed that 7% of undergraduates and 6% of graduate students reported the in inability to purchase course materials or access codes due to financial hardship. And those seem like very small percentages, um, but it, it amounts to a, a large number of students. So that means that almost um, 500 undergraduate students didn't get resources and over 100 um, graduate students didn't purchase course materials because of financial um, issues. And they reported that that had significant impacts on their academic achievement. Um, I think we could all agree that Villanova classroom shouldn't have any students in them without the course materials that um, they're expected to be using. Um, with that said, uh, we can look on the bright side. The OER award outcomes have been um, really great in the fall of 2021. The savings are estimated at uh, th over $36,000. And over the life of the award, um, we estimate that students have saved um, over $92,000. And um, probably more importantly, I, we think that the award is creating um, fertile ground for faculty to adopt OER. Um, most recently, we learned that um, the, the chemistry department did um, a 
redesign of the uh, of foundational um, chemistry class, and they did a very thorough textbook review. And within that review, they chose to use an OpenStax textbook, and that will be implemented in the fall of um, 2022. Um, and there are also some other sections that are using it, like um, there are multiple sections of intro to microeconomics that are using an OpenStax textbook. And there's also an, an MBA class that's um, using an OpenStax um, textbooks. And that's not the only source of uh, open educational resources that we'll hear about, we'll hear about some others um, coming up too. So before we, we get to, to the main, main event, I just want to recognize um, some, some folks that have made this award uh, possible. Um, so the heavy lifting for the award was really done in establishing the criteria and um, for the award and reviewing the applicants. And so um, a lot of time went into that. And uh, the folks that did read that were Deborah Arbonides, Samantha Chapman, uh, Millicent Gaskell, Billy Murray, um, Jennifer Ross, Shweta Shrestha, Susie, and Lauren Ward. Um, and I'd also like to give a shout out um, to the uh, all the folks that donated to the Affordable Materials Project through the 1842 um, campaign. This is the first year that we participated in that and the money that we raised um, through that campaign will um, make this award more sustainable going forward. And so with that, I would like to introduce our two main speakers today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Professor um, Jean Lidica um, and she'll tell us about her OER journey. Jean is Assistant Professor of Marketing and Business Law. She teaches the VSB um, core course on corporate responsibility and regulation and has designed popular elective courses on contracts and intellectual property. Before her academic career, she was a practicing attorney um, and she's been recognized at Villanova for teaching excellence and innovation. Jean is a trusted faculty member to undergraduate students um, considering legal careers and a uh, uh, um, and then our other speaker is Valentina um, Dinardis, and she's the director of classical studies. She's an authority on Latin poetry, especially Ovid and Manilius. She's an intrepid proponent for the creative use of technology to enhance teaching using Microsoft um, tools, um, leading her students creating interactive maps and virtual reality models of the ancient world, and of course, by using OER. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jean. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. And I'm really honored and excited to be here. I am a huge supporter of the Affordable Materials Project. And I am so grateful that Villanova has invested um, actual dollars into promoting um, OER and making resources more accessible to all of the students. Um, so my background with OER actually comes with my intellectual property class, which um, I designed in for the spring of 2020. And um, I wanted to offer this class, which is actually fairly unusual in undergraduate business schools. Intellectual property law has always been considered something specific for law schools, and there are, it's not commonly taught in the undergraduate level. And I really felt given that we have this information economy that we really need to prepare our students to go out into that business world knowing how information is protected and, 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 and how it can be accessed. So I started off thinking I wanna teach this class, but it's not a topic I know a lot about. So I was really heavily dependent on finding a good textbook um, that could explain the material in a way that made sense uh, to me and the students, if you will. Um, and I wanted to use an OER textbook because I really wanted this to be something that all students had equal access to. The nice thing about OER is no one can ever say, I didn't do the reading because I didn't have the book. Then you just take that excuse right off the table. It's, it's always accessible. They can't say they left it somewhere. They left it at home on break. They always have the reading. Um, so my challenge for that class was to find a good book um, because again, it's rarely taught at the undergraduate level. Uh, so I wanted more than the standard chapter on intellectual property law that you might find in an introductory undergraduate business law class uh, or textbook. So um, I didn't have a lot of choices in terms of trying to find a text, but luckily uh, two authors, two law professors at Duke, James Boyle and Jennifer Jenkins, had written this um, intellectual property law uh, OER textbook which is really fantastic. Um, the one downside is it's a law school text. 
So my challenge in this, in using this particular textbook was to find a way to um, use this book, which is really designed for law students and try to make it digestible for undergraduate business students. Um, and my perspective in the class is I want the students again to be business people learning how to operate within the structures of the law and, and specifically intellectual property law, not necessarily to learn to be practitioners and go on to, to law school. So um, one thing I found with this textbook um, is that it is very flexible. Um, the nice thing about OER is I can easily supplement it, and particularly in my field where case law and articles are all very uh, publicly available and easy to find. So anytime I want to supplement um, uh, or explain or add something new, for example, I want to add more of the business person's perspective on intellectual property law versus the legal perspective, I can always find uh, an online article that I can supplement the textbook with. Um, but in this class, the intellectual property class, it is very textbook heavy. Um, this particular branch of law is very dependent on court decisions. Uh, we don't have um, a lot of direction from legislatures and statutes. It's a very evolving uh, a branch of law because technology is always evolving, so the law has to evolve with it. So um, it's very case dependent, and there's a lot of complicated material in the textbook. Um, I think one thing about this textbook versus uh, an undergraduate or a textbook designed for undergraduates is it doesn't have as much explanation of sort of the mechanics of how things works because it's always focused on policy. So I guess to the extent I've had some struggles with the textbook, it mostly has to do with the fact that the content's really aimed at a different audience than I'm teaching to. It's aimed, aimed for the law school students. And so my challenges with the textbooks have been to try to make that information more accessible to my students and also to supplement it to make sure I'm uh, focusing on what my students are interested in, which again is some of the business side of how the law works. Um, but that being said, I really pleased with the textbook. I think it's very well written. Um, the authors, I first taught the class in spring of 2020. They've since then done an update. So it's very current and which is another nice thing with OER. I think it's easy to update. Um, and um, the authors do offer a hard uh, paperback version, which they only charge $34 with because the authors themselves feel very strongly that material should be affordable. So uh, if a student does prefer a hard copy that they can mark up, that option is available for them, which I like also, because that way we're really uh, providing a resource for all different types of learning styles. Um, and uh, the result is I just, I depend on the, 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 case, the textbook very heavily. Um, but as I said, I can take and select what I want to use. I can, it's modular. So if there's material that I think is a too far above our heads or not really in the, uh, the focus that I want, I can easily skip that through that. So I've been really pleased with that, that textbook in that class. And my success using the OER text in the law, intellectual property class made me think I should switch my other elective, which is a, a class based on contract law, um, over to OER as well. Now that class is different. Um, it is a class I had taught previously with a traditional textbook and I already had lectures and, and um, material prepared. It's also a less dynamic area of the law. Intellectual property is always trying to change and catch up as technology is developing. Contract law is a lot more uh, well established so we don't have as much volatility. So it's easier to use an older uh, textbook that is isn't uh, um, updated as often. The other thing about uh, the contract law material is um, uh, there is more available at the undergraduate level. Um, the trick there, though, is we already teach a lot of contract law in the introductory corporate responsibility and regulation, which is the introductory business law and ethics class. So I needed to find something that had more depth than that is presented in the typical sort of introductory um, undergraduate business law uh, textbook, but still not going up necessarily to the law school level. 
Um, and so that was a little bit tricky, was trying to find a text that had more detail than an introductory book, but less detail than a law school textbook. Um, so I did find a textbook that um, works pretty well for that purposes. It is an older text. Um, but again, the nice thing, particularly with my material, is I can always provide the students with supplemental material. So if there was a case that I've always taught that I thought was really good and it's not in the new textbook, I can just um, direct the students to read that uh, case online or I can provide it to them online or something like that. So I did find that supplementing um, the textbook was, was necessary, um, but also pretty easy to do. Um, so the textbook that I ended up with was older um, and that worked for this purposes for this purpose of this contracts class because because I had the class already prepared, um, I used the textbook more as a reference. So the students really get the main thrust of the content through the lectures and they use the textbook more as a reference. So if there's something in the lectures they're unclear about, they can go back to the text. I supplemented heavily with other cases. Um, that I provided that weren't in the text. I did use some of the text uh, cases. Um, I wasn't thrilled with the format of this textbook, of the contracts textbook, um, because it had all the narrative up front and then it would have the cases, which is sort of the applied examples of how these different legal rules work in the back of a chapter, but not embedded in the individual sections. And I, I thought that was a little bit difficult for the students to navigate. I didn't particularly care for that. But again, for my purposes, using the textbook more as a reference than as a main source of learning, it worked out okay. Um, I'm still considering whether I might want to switch up to a law school level text. I did find a very good one that I thought was extremely well written. Um, I thought at the time it might be a little bit over my students' heads, but um, given the success of the intellectual property law tech, uh, text, at least in my viewpoint, we'll hear from my students in a minute, um, I still think maybe that might be something I'm going to explore doing also. And then one other thing I wanted to point out is what an incredible research Linda uh, asset um, and resource Linda has been. So now that we I've switched my two elective classes over to OER, I would really love to be able to switch um, the VSB core course, Corporate Responsibility and Regulation, over to OER. And that's something I'm in a conversation with with my colleagues. I don't know if it's going to happen. But Linda has been incredibly helpful. And I gave her my syllabus and said, here are the topics we teach. And she went and created this whole spreadsheet for me of the different OER possibilities that we could look at and their coverage on all the different topics uh, for my syllabus. And she's just made it so easy for me. So I'm not starting from scratch doing searches on the internet, trying to find a textbook. So if anyone's interested in OER, I strongly recommend taking advantage of how helpful and supportive um, Linda can be in helping you find a, a good text. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for those really kind words. <laughs> So, and, and um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Valentina. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint. And I'm not sure why it's not, <laughs> there we go. Whoops. There we go. Can everyone see it? All right. So uh, I'm focused on classical literature. In the classical studies program, we have an undergraduate BA program. We have a, um, a master's program in classics, uh, a large part of which is composed of distance learners. And uh, we study um, any aspect of the ancient uh, Greco-Roman world. We study history, we study um, culture, literature, the languages, and I really wanted to focus on classical literature for this OER project because there really are so many resources that you need um, for, for studying classical literature. 
So uh, as we've already been talking about, uh, why why OER? Well, books are expensive. Um, I, I was a first generation college student and then obviously first generation graduate student. Uh, I was often overwhelmed by the, the cost of some of these fancy Greek and Latin texts. Uh, my heart would sink. I remember in grad school when uh, I had a, a text of a particular author and work, but the professor said, oh no, we're not using that text. You need the such and such edition, uh, which of course would always be a lot more expensive. And um, that was really stressful and frustrating. Um, I actually met my husband in graduate school and we were in a class together where the professor uh, required us to buy a, a scholarly monograph that we did not end up using in the course <laughs> and it was very expensive and so now <laughs> being married we have two copies of that expensive book that we never used um so yeah that was that was fabulous um the other reason uh for using oer is that accessing digital materials is really convenient uh, i went to graduate school in new york city and oftentimes the only place to find a particular article was at the new york public library so i'd have to go there there and you'd have to submit a request for, for the actual work. And then you'd have to hope you had enough nickels and dimes for the photocopy machines. And of course, you'd run out with like two pages to go or something like that. So um, took a lot of time and effort and, uh, and expense. And then um, digital materials are accessible. Um, there are screen readers and all sorts of uh, accessibility tools that um, students can rely on when accessing things digitally. So what exactly are we doing in a classical literature course? So over on the left in the image there, this is uh, from a text of Ovid's Metamorphoses. We're mainly focused on translating a Latin or Greek text. Um, the grammar can be really complicated. So we want to be analyzing those grammatical constructions and figuring out exactly what they are. We can be puzzling over words. Um, at the bottom of the page, there's a bunch of words and letters down there. That is actually telling us um, which manuscripts have a variant reading of a particular word or phrase from the text. So whichever editor put together this text made a decision on like, say there are 26 manuscripts or something of a particular uh, author and work from the ancient world, medieval manuscripts that survive. And then um, there can be different words in a particular line and, and the editor that puts together the text that you're gonna read in your class um, needs to make a decision on which word he thinks or she thinks is the one that was likely written by the author, but then you put all the others um, in, uh, in that space at the bottom of the page. So um, lots to talk about there. Of course, we're gonna discuss the style and then we wanna think a little bit about the historical and cultural context of the work. So you need a lot of resources for all this. Obviously you need a copy of the text itself you would really be happy to have a commentary with some notes that give some of that historical context or maybe a little help with some of the more difficult grammatical constructions. You need a dictionary um, because we don't all have all of Greek and, and Latin vocabulary stuck in our heads. Um, you might want to consult a couple of different translations just to get like the bigger picture um, and not dive in cold to a translation. Um, they're not typically literal. Uh, if you pick up three different translations of Homer's Iliad, you'll find that the translators take liberties um, in how they interpret things. But um, look, it can be good for, for the big picture, as I said. It's useful to have a grammar book. If you don't uh, know a particular grammatical construction, you can look it up and see other examples of it and understand better how it's used. And then for some uh, for some additional context, you want to be able to read some essays or journal articles about um, that particular work. Um, speaking of dictionaries, you can buy a pocket dictionary, but uh, that's not too expensive. But if you want the really fancy dictionary, oh, look, the Oxford Latin Dictionary. It's on sale for $295, marked down from $450. Um, the nice thing about the big dictionary like this is that uh, not only do you get the meanings, but uh, you get a list of 
who, which author used that word in that particular meaning and which work it was in. And it's actually quoted there in the dictionary. And it just kind of blows my mind that the people who created these dictionaries um, did this before there were computers or even post-it notes. So um, it's kind of amazing. The Greek equivalent is the Greek English lexicon, uh, originally by uh, three gentlemen named uh, Little Scott and Jones. Uh, Little's daughter, by the by the way, was Alice Little, who was the inspiration for Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. Um, but hey, this this is a bargain: two hundred and twenty dollars um, for the big Greek dictionary compared to the Latin one. And uh, as you can see from my photo there, there are actually um, three different sizes that you can choose from, which are called the little little, the middle little, and the big little, or just the great Scott. So um, take your pick there, depending on how much you wanna spend. So here's my main resource that I used um, for my class last fall. Dickinson College uh, Commentaries. So this is a website that was created by a classics professor at Dickinson, Christopher Francese, and uh, multiple scholars have been adding to this site. So there are a handful of Greek texts, there are a handful of Latin texts, and each one uh, includes the actual Greek or Latin text. It includes a nice running commentary of helpful notes and uh, a running vocabulary. And then oftentimes it will link uh, essays that um, some scholars have written to, to go along with particular poems or different parts of texts. And as, as you can see, there are additional um, resources on this website. So this has just been really amazing because it brings so many of those resources that we need for classical literature all in one place. Um, there are additional places where you can get uh, texts and uh, vocabulary like the Perseus Digital Library. It has pretty much almost all of Greek and Roman literature there, a translation as well. And then um, you can actually click on the Greek or Latin word and then it'll give you the, the meaning and what form the word is. Um, so, so it's kind of like a built-in dictionary um, that you can easily click on. There are some grammar works that they have uh, uploaded there. Um, a, a favorite of mine is the uh, a resource of mine that it's a favorite is the Princeton Encyclopedia of Classical Sites. I always like to, you know, I find a, a site that's mentioned um, in a work that we're reading, and I love to look it up and see what was there and what author other authors mentioned that site in the ancient world. Um, like I mentioned, it's it's nice to have a grammar book. Um, so this one I used to use a print copy of, but discovered that um, through Falvey, it's available as an ebook. So you should always check that out um, because you know so many sites are created that are, are new resources for us. So many books that we may have been using are now available at as ebooks at no cost to our students. So um, really helpful there. For additional essays, I mentioned there were some essays on that Dickinson site, but for additional essays and articles, I love to use JSTOR. I can target my search for a particular work or even a particular poem, really easy to search. I can either download a PDF of the article or just give the students the, the JSTOR link. And it's also really neat that it has a great citation tool, uh, tool for um, students to use. Um, you might check with your professional organization in your academic field. They often have a list of websites, um, of databases for texts, for artifacts, um, maps, uh, museum archives, uh, all sorts of things that um, they've gath gathered together to help you and your students um, in your field. And don't forget about Falvey Library. You can click on your subject guide on the main page of Falvey Library's website and find all sorts of um, great suggested reference works, databases, um, and classics. We've got some great videos. And then you also have your, your friendly um, librarian who is focused on your particular field who can help you out as well. Um, another thing I just wanna mention uh, as I close here is that I wanna make sure these things are very accessible to my students so that they I don't give them a printed list of these resources, but I, I put all the links together in um, a Microsoft digital notebook, a OneNote class notebook that um, my students have access to. And then just all the resources are there, 
organized. They know where to find them. They can just click on the link and open it up right there. That digital notebook also has uh, a space where students can collaborate and upload um, things that they're sharing with the class. For example, maybe a PowerPoint presentation that they're sharing uh, when they're giving an oral report in class. So, um, and then I often put the text of what we're looking at on a page in our OneNote class notebook. And then I can digitally annotate it and write notes on it as we're discussing it in the class. It's kind of like a whiteboard that goes home with the students. Um, so again, I sort of feel like that all makes it e even more accessible to students, just having it all in one place. Um, so yeah, hope you've gotten some good ideas from what I've said today. Thank you so much. Um, I know I have some questions that maybe we'll um, hold those till uh, we hear from from some of the students. And so maybe what I what I'd really like is I, I um, for the students to uh, maybe each identify themselves, say what um, their major is and what what uh, class they used OER for, um, and uh, and from there uh, we can we can hear hear from them. So maybe. Uh, I'll ask, I guess I'm seeing Lauren Murphy um, on the screen. So maybe I'll ask Lauren to unmute yourself. Maybe if all the students could, could you know, unmute yourselves and um, turn on your, your video, that would be great. And so if, if Lauren, could you just tell us what class you're in and Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Murphy. I am a biology major here, but I was in Dr. Danardis's um, Latin 3000, um, where we focused on Ovid. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, Val um, Valer Valeria? Yes, hi. My name is Valeria. I am a marketing, but I have a minor in business law. So the class I'm using OER for is intellectual property. Cool. Um, is Rita here? Yeah, um, I'm Rita. I also have a business law minor, so I'm using OER for uh, Professor Litka's um, intellectual property class. Great, and Kendall? Hi, my name is Kendall. I am a marketing and management major with a minor in business law, and I was in um, Professor Litka's contracts law class last semester. And um, Olivia? I am an econ and classics major, and I was in Dr. Denardis's Latin one and two. Nice. And and uh, Anna, or Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a senior in VSB, and I uh, did OER with Professor Lidka in her contracts class last semester. Great. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we want to know about is like just in general, like what was your experience using um, this, you know, in OER uh, materials. Um, well, for me, I think it was great uh, in Professor Lidka's class that um, our textbook wasn't like the main focus of our class so that I was able to just go to it whenever I needed a little more information on something that was talked about in class. And the fact that it was so easily accessible and free made it easy to be able to do that because if it hadn't been, I probably wouldn't have bought the textbook and would have probably just been bothering Professor Lidka, which she probably wouldn't have minded uh, just for <laughs> more information. But I think that it was so readily accessible to us and so easy to get a hold of, um, made it really easy for me to be able to use it as an extra resource. Great, so I, it, uh, I'm hearing that um, one of the things that you liked about it is because it wasn't sort of the backbone of the class, that you really appreciated that it, it was a free resource because because a lot of students I think have a hard time when a resource they're told to use it as a required material and it ends up being like supplementary I'm kind of like Valentina was talking about you know actually in, in one instance you know when she was in grad school never using the book at all that's that's an extreme case but it seems like that there's maybe a a continuum. Anyone else want to just talk about their, you know, general impression of you? Um, something that I really like about the textbook is that they're very updated, which is something that you don't get when you buy physical models because it takes time to print. 
And like something that is very annoying too is that when you buy a textbook thinking that you were going to be able to sell it after because they're so expensive, but then as you're using it, they come out with a new version. So then the textbook that was worth $100 is now probably $10 at most. So it feels like a loss of like resource, but like with the textbook we're using for intellectual property, all like the case court cases are very updated, which is something so important because intellectual property is constantly shifting with the world and moving into more technology. So we have cases that have to do with like NFTs that are very updated that are going to prepare you for like what you're going to deal with once you exit like this college bubble. So I really like that they're updated and like the value isn't lost because yes, it's cheap, but it's also updated and accessible, like um, mentioned, like Kendall mentioned. And I also like that because it is cheap and accessible, it includes everyone in the conversation, which is like allows us to have class discussions because a lot of like a lot of people, it's hard to like pay for college, especially when like you can get an email one day being like tuition increasing. So it's hard to stay in college and it's even harder to participate if your textbooks are gonna be worth so much more. But like by having cheap material, you include everyone in the conversation, which is like super, it's always really important. And it's also extremely beneficial with like classes like law where like debate is the main focus. Um, so because of that, I feel like we have a lot of fun debates where everyone's included because everyone has access to this material and the material is also very much relevant to class. So it doesn't feel like a waste of time. And it's actually something that you're gonna utilize and encounter in the future. Thank you. Olivia, you look like you might wanna. Um, I was just gonna add that I think like also being online and the, the platform allows for it to be like more interactive and better for visual learning. I feel like, like for instance, Dickinson had like videos, maps, like all the stuff that you like typically on the like book, you, either you'd be like flipping to the back of the book, which is so annoying to look at the notes or like, uh, like back to the intro and like it's all in one spot. So you just like could look and learn easier instead. And we're also like, maybe more likely to look and like look up what's going on and like look at the map because it's all in one place. So the digital text sounds like just the format itself promoted more engagement with the text. Gotcha. Also going off of what Olivia said, I really like that it was digital just because it's, I like for me personally, I'm more likely to like bring my computer to go study rather than like a whole textbook. So if I'm already doing homework and then I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot to like look up this definition or look up this case. I could just pull up the book on my computer, which I have rather than like writing out a note and saying like, oh, check this when I get back to my room. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and then also for the PDF version of our contracts textbook, they, um, at least on my computer, you can write like little sticky notes on the page. So I thought that was super helpful as well. So instead of like writing in a book that you buy or like you rent, because you don't want to like ruin the book if you're going to like return it type of situation. So I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to? Um, especially for the Latin class that I was in with Dr. Donardis, um, we had a lot of different resources um, just that to use in order to help us translate and to under, better understand the vocabulary, like she said. And so just being able to read the poem that we were doing and then being able to, you know, highlight the word or click it and then go to the dictionary and just be able to pull them up side by side. Um, it made for a much easier translation for me, um, especially since I've taken Latin in the past where I've had, you know, five, six books where I've had to switch through um, a Latin dictionary or a Greek dictionary. And then just having it all in one place side by side, it definitely um, helped me not not only learn better, but just easier. Cool. It, it's interesting because not long ago, um, a lot of surveys of students and um, studies were all pointing to um, students not really wanting to use digital text, like there being resistance to that. And we're not hearing that so much anymore, and certainly not from you all 
um, right now. Um, but in a lot of circles, not very long ago, it was considered, a, uh, I think, a significant barrier. So that's interesting. Um, I guess another sort of uh, thing that I would like to hear about is uh, like compared to using a commercial text, like what were there any differences or um, using a, a free textbook? I know I can kind of talk on this one that I took CRR with Professor Litka and then I took intellectual property. So I kind of dealt with that physical textbook where we pay for everything versus the OER. I really, as it is like a higher level, but the class is also a higher level. So I didn't see that as like too much of a problem, but um, I think it is the backbone of our class. It's not like the contracts law class. It, it's like we use it every single day. It's how we kind of go into class with the background. Um, and even though it is the background, our background, our backbone, sorry, and it's free, I really haven't seen a difference compared to my CRR class where that same textbook that I paid a lot of money for was the backbone and we read it every single day. I seem to have the same experience in both classes, even though one's free and one wasn't. And I really appreciate it. Even it's online, I still can do the exact same things. Honestly, I use my CRR textbook online too, and I haven't seen a difference at all in kind of how I've learned. I've seen it be the exact same experience, just kind of a free version, which has been super helpful. Nice. Um, I guess sort of like a very um, broad question uh, I'd like to ask is, you know, if if you could, if you could talk to your um, your professors and talk to the university in general, like what would you like them to know about your attitudes towards textbooks and course materials that you use? Is there anything that you'd like to share with them? Would you like them to hear about what you think about um, the textbook course material um, part of your your college experience so far? I wish um, in the uh, one thing I would like if like in the beginning before even the class starts like I wish there were more emails in advance on what the textbook was because like if there is no open resource like to get the discount textbooks usually it costs or it, the shipping's longer and so like if you want the lower price you usually like there's like a delay of two weeks and then you're behind in the material already with like so like an email a week in advance makes a difference if there is no open material uh, open resource. I would definitely want them to know how much um, I think being in my class with, you know, open resources and not having to pay for textbooks or resources has impacted me. Um, Latin was one of my favorite classes last semester, and I think a large part of it was because the first day Dr. Donardis said, you know, we don't, you don't pay for anything. Um, and that really was like a relief to me um, because college you know, as said, is expensive already. And then, you know, having to worry about paying for textbooks and everything. Um, and especially a lot of the core classes we have to take here, like ancients, moderns, you know, they require a lot of different books. And usually you can, you know, find them from, um, you know, cheaper places. But as Olivia said, sometimes they don't let you know until it's too late and you kind of just have to you know buy what the buy, buy what the library has or um pay for the highest price just to have it um so being able to use free resources for classes where you have to spend a lot of money on books i think it would overall um help benefit everyone like professors and students I also want to add that I just think that by eliminating the barrier of like the economic barrier of buying textbooks, you kind of like, again, get everyone more involved. So not only is it helping the students, but it also helps the professor because there is no, there's really no excuse if their resources are free as to like why you don't have 
learning materials. So I feel like it evens the playing field and then allows for everyone to actually learn. And I feel like it also like sometimes could be seen as a discouragement to take a class when you know that you're gonna have to buy a lot of like materials for that class. So if someone was like wanting to pursue a minor in English, they could get discouraged by having to buy so many books or like supplemental material that comes with that, even though they could be really passionate. So I feel like by having like textbooks that are free or like low cost kind of like allows you to be more creative with your education and like explore more. Whereas you might not be willing to take that financial risk for a class you don't know if you're going to like or not. Well, wow, that's what you just said is very important that um, that faculty can benefit by using um, low cost, uh, high quality sources, and that um, hearing from students that that. Uh, sometimes the cost of materials does play a significant role um, in what classes you take um, is also, you know, something that uh, hopefully the university will um, to listen to because uh, I think that's the last thing that we want is to discourage um, potential students from exploring because of the high cost of, of materials. Um, I, I did want to, like a couple of you mentioned about the knowing when resources were, what resources would be required upfront. That's something that like the Affordable Materials Project like works um, to, to try to make that information more readily available. So we, um, we encourage faculty to report their adoptions early um, to the, the bookstore and to report them fully. And I think we're finding out that like, so when you when you uh, go on Novasys to see what classes are available, when you're on that system, you should be able to click on a link and see what the course materials are. That information is not always as complete as it, as it could be. Um, and so we'd like to always, you know, broadcast and, and encourage faculty to get that information included in there. And then also there's another resource that I don't think students often know about, but there's um, a syllabus archive that faculty are asked to, to always include all the resources that are requir required on syllabi. So potentially you could go to search for the syllabus archive and um, look at the materials that are required and they should be included um, in the syllabus too. Um, but it's, it is an it's it's a it's an issue. Um, some schools have had uh, have course marking, so when you go to sign up for a class, you can see if it's a quote unquote an affordable class, and that might be something Villanova might want to consider. Um, with that, we we have a, a couple minutes. I I would like to ask the other uh, um, folks attending here if they have questions that they'd like to hear from um, the students. So maybe um, if you. If you have a question, if you could unmute yourself and, and um, ask our student panelists questions, I'd like to open it up for that. Or if you'd like to put a question into the chat, um, that's another good place to, to add a, a question. Um, can all the attendees unmute themselves? Or do, um, I guess, do I have to? Uh... They should be able to. Okay. Yeah. But if not, they could raise their hand and I can unmute them. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Kathy Toner. I just wanted to thank all the students for being here. Um, I work in VSB as well. And it's just, it's really nice to hear your perspectives and to understand what's important to you and what you've appreciated and enjoyed about um, some of the um, more reasonable cost or no cost materials. So um, I don't necessarily have a question, but I did just wanna thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your perspectives. I think it's great for those of us who teach to hear that. I'd like to second that, thank you. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to know if, if you students and other attendees have questions for um, um, 
Valentina and Jean. Again, you can just unmute yourself or use the chat. I guess I have a question just to professors, like, is there some requirement for, um, like, to have a textbook instead of uh, just, like, loose material, like, on, from the, like, I don't know what other side it would be, because I've been, like, there are a bunch of classes that you get, the textbook is never used, but, like, I don't know if teachers just think that they have to require a textbook for, like, your backup learning, or, and, like, it's, like, Unwritten, under not said, but like, like I almost wish in the beginning of the class, like the teacher was like, we don't, we're not really going to use this. Like, you don't actually need it. This is just uh, supplementary. Yeah, I'll I'll chime in here. So, um, typically, a, a professor would choose um, all the materials for a class. Um, although certain academic departments might um have certain standards or or plans for a certain type of class um, that they want everyone to follow everyone to use a certain textbook and then maybe the professor teaching that particular section is like oh i don't really like this one um so so yeah that's definitely an issue that that should be raised um i always like to uh allow my faculty and classics to use what they want to use um, and uh, in working on this OER project, I'm hoping that my model can serve um, as an example for all of our classical literature courses in, in the classics program. I mean, there are definitely authors and works where you don't have these OER resources, but it's like, well, come on guys, let's think about this. <laughs> let's think about um, what resources are available and maybe you wanna make a choice to to work on an author where your students are gonna have this um, free or low cost uh, resource instead of making it all the more challenging uh, financially. So um, I definitely think it's something that more faculty and more departments should think about. And uh, I'm really excited that about this whole um, OER project. Uh, so I thank Falby for working on this and, and I'm glad to help shine some light on it. Thanks. Yes, my only um, addition to that would be uh, the VSB in the, the business school, we have core courses and we are trying to coordinate the core courses so students have a consistent experience no matter what section they're in. For those core courses, we do try to have all the faculty use the same textbook. If there's going to be a textbook, they should all be using the same textbook so students are getting, again, some consistency across the different sections. Um, but as to whether or not we use a textbook or not, that's a, we have the freedom to design our courses the way we want and around the textbook. So again, in my intellectual property class, we use the textbook very heavily in the contracts class. I don't need it quite as much. It's more of a reference. And that's just the way I've designed the courses. I have a question um, for both of you. I'd like to know um, what, what kind of support do you think that the university could provide you um, to make this whole um, adoption of OER? And um, I think uh, you've both customized in one way or another the resources that you that you used and and um did you feel like that was entirely seamless and you felt like you were well situated you had all the tools that you needed to do that or you know you know can, can you think of is there um, any support that would have made that process um easier for you or better Yeah, I feel like I'm sort of in touch with a lot of digital stuff being, uh, you know, just enjoying it myself, but some faculty um, may, you know, not be aware of what's out there. So um, maybe encouraging faculty to get in touch with their subject area librarians to help them, you know, uh, meet a couple times and, and work on how do you find what OER resources are available for a particular field or a particular course. 
So that might be helpful. Letting letting people know that um, Falvey can help on that. Um, I think on the demand side, um, just having events like this, providing the grant is all very helpful. I think raising awareness, I think the survey that Randy mentioned at the beginning, I think a lot of faculty, um, as he said, are somewhat oblivious um, about students' financial status or just don't realize that students have to choose, you know, is it really worth it for me to spend $300 on a textbook we're only gonna use twice? Um, so I think raising awareness, um, all of that is starting and I think it's helpful, but I also think the other problem is the supply side of, of what resources are available. So as I was saying, I had a real struggle trying to find um, a contracts book that kind of met that middle ground of not so introductory that it would be in an introductory class, but it, it provides more detail than I've already provided my introductory class, but not yet being at the law school level. So I, I'm hoping as OER proliferates that there'll be more text written and available. And I don't know how many faculty at Villanova write and produce textbooks, but I don't know what support there is um, I would think maybe that would be a direction to go because I think that would also be great for the university in terms of its branding of saying, look what we're doing, not only on the supply, um, demand side, but also on the supply side. And if we could get faculty from other schools to be using our textbooks, I think that would be really something for us. Yeah, that's that's kind of a nice segue into, I was, I was gonna ask Valentina, but you, you thought of, of how the Dickinson um, commentaries um, contributed to Dickinson's uh, stature um, amongst, you know, classic scholars. Yeah, a lot of people know about Dickinson's classics department now. And um, <laughs> as I mentioned, other, you know, scholars from other universities have contributed to it, but um, definitely it's raised, raised the profile of that program. Yeah. So I think that we're at time now. So I, I would like to, um, close the program by, by thanking you both and thanking all the um, everyone that's come and especially the students. And I'd like to just turn it over um, to Utah Seibert um, for some closing remarks. Hello everyone. My name is Jutta Seibert and I'm one of the Fowler Library's liaison librarians and the director of research services and scholarly engagement. Nelson Gaskell, the university librarian, has asked me to stand in for her today as she was unfortunately unable to attend herself. Before we close the event today, I want to make um, a, take a moment to offer thanks and share important information about future opportunities for faculty to engage in and support the OER initiatives. On behalf of the Affordable Materials Project Committee and Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to formally thank Dr. Randy Weinstein Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning and Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering for his support uh, of AMP initiatives. Most notably, his help has enabled AMP to offer the OER Faculty Adoption Award to the faculty, uh, to the Villanova community once again for the coming academic year. Details about the award may be found on Falvey uh, Library's homepage. And I can share the link with you on chat. In addition to the OER Faculty Adoption Award, I want to share information about another OER opportunity. VITAL in invites applicants for its 2022-23 mini grants program. The purpose of these uh, internal instructional grants is to support full-time Villanova faculty members in fostering advances in undergraduate and graduate teaching and learning at Villanova implementing the university's educational goals and exploring the use of new instructional strategies. Proposals that address educational topics and areas, including OER authoring, adaption and adoption are of particular interest. The call for proposals will close on Friday, March 14 at 5 p.m. Information about this can be found on VITAL's web pages. And again, let me give you the link. Finally, I would like to thank faculty, uh, the faculty program participants and reviewers for the willingness to utilize open educational resources and their students who were part of the journey. 
I would also like to thank students for sharing their experiences on our panel today. With that, I wish you all a good evening and thank you for your interest and support of open educational resources at Villanova University.